I was walking in New York City, and 2011 was a very uh, a difficult year. I was getting really close to a lot of roles I really, really wanted, and I just, just wasn't closing it. And then I got a call on a really cold day from my business manager saying, I was just about to call you to tell you that you have one month left of, of resources before you need a job, but you just received the residual for your hot tub time machine movie. <laughs> so you're okay for a little bit more. Hi, my name is Sebastian Stan, and this is the timeline of my career. It was in that Michael Haneke movie called 71 Fragments. In Vienna, Austria, I played a Romanian orphan kid, and I guess I was selected to have this one scene where my character interacts with um, another character in the subway. That was my very first, uh, I guess, on-camera experience, and I remember hating it. We had to be there all night, and, and I told my mom that I just, I never want to act again, and she sort of uh, allowed me to sort of find my way back to it, and it wasn't really until 14, 15, when I auditioned for uh, the school play. I'd mainly done it because my best friend at the time was in it, and, um, I think once I saw him do that, I, I had enough courage to try it again, and then that's how everything sort of started. Ooh, Richie! Oops, wait. Did I, did I just say witch? I'd gotten out of uh, college uh, at Rutgers, moved into the city on 42nd Street, actually, across from Port Authority. I had a roommate, and we each paid $800 a month, which was a great deal at the time. And it was sort of this wild, magical time, being in New York and running to auditions. And fortunately, uh, I booked my first uh, movie role, which was this movie called The Architect. And then shortly after that, uh, through an audition tape where I decided to smoke cigarettes because I guess, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I was doing. But it had worked because for some reason it was for the villain character and I got a call right away and, 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 and then I had an audition with Rennie Harlan for this very peculiar movie called The Covenant starring four warlocks. I just remember getting that phone call and it happened like right before my birthday. It was like the greatest birthday present ever. It was just a really, really beautiful moment that kind of, you know, maybe I don't have to go back to being a waiter. I can kind of ride this for a little while. Look, I don't think it's such a good idea. If you're ever gonna take a risk, start now. What's the point of anything less? I did my first Broadway show with Leah Schreiber called Talk Radio, and that allowed me to be in New York for five, six months opposite this incredible actor. I remember I was so depressed when the show ended because I didn't have a job, and I was just worried again, how are you going to pay the bills and all that. And then fortunately, one of my really good friends from The Covenant, Chase Crawford, was coming to New York to start a new show called Gossip Girl. There was a guest star episode with this character named Carter Bazin, and I remember I was going to Silver Cup Studios to audition for this, and on my way there, I ran into a friend that I was sharing an apartment with him and his girlfriend at the time, and we, I realized we're both going out for the same part, and it's like, oh God, now, now we're both looking at each other like, who's gonna get it? Maybe I can call Chase, and I don't know, he can help me get this part, or he can just tell them, but I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna go, and if I have a call back, and if for some reason there's any interest whatsoever in this, then maybe I'll let him know, and then maybe something will happen. And um, uh, fortunately, I did, I did get a call back, <laughs> and I think my other friend told me, if, to this day, is like, you got that role because of Chase. <laughs> and who knows, I probably did, maybe, but I got it. Again, I was all relatively new at the time, and I remember uh, being on the set, um, and um, Ed Westwick's uh, agent at the time came up to me, pulled me aside and he said, you're doing too much. <laughs> Tone it down. And then they just kept bringing me back, fortunately, for, for a couple years. It was interesting because Gossip Girl uh, at the time was just unbelievably explosive. To be on the sidelines and, and kind of um, just see, you know, everybody navigate that, that level of attention and fame like that, 
It was a very informative sort of time in a way because uh, just growing up in New York and having a job in New York City and being able to stay home was just so exciting and, and I think, um, yeah, it was, it was a big growing up experience. Wow, ballerinas. No wonder you two look alike. So, you know, Tom and Jerry here are gay lovers. Very funny. I like to amuse myself. I've never been to the ballet. Black Swan was cast by this unbelievable casting director, Mary Vernu, who cast Itania later in Pam and Tommy. It's just interesting how sometimes things come back around, but Darren Aronofsky was one of the, continues to be, in my opinion, one of my favorite directors, and, and his movies were absolutely insane. It really didn't matter what the part was gonna be. It was just more the idea of working with him. And then I remember he looked at me and said, do you have any, do you have any friends? <laughs> and I was like, I think so. And he was like, well, I don't know. It, do you, is there a friend that could play the other part? Because what I want is this, these two guys on a date with Mila Kunis and Natalie Portman. And it's just one scene, but I want there to be a real chemistry. So with a friend of yours, that maybe is an actor. And I thought about it, and I remember I called, again, somebody from The Covenant, Toby Hemingway, and, and he was in Los Angeles. I said, you gotta go right now to Mary Renew and audition for this, because you and I could play friends. And we are friends. And it was really interesting because he and I were nervous to, to obviously to be opposite Natalie Portman and Mila Kunis. And then the fact that we had to make out with them, the whole thing was nerve wracking. I just sort of thought, you know what? Maybe this guy is nervous himself to be on this date. So if that's what's going on for me right now, I guess that's what's gonna have to happen. <laughs> but he, Darren came in and he had a full on backstory for every character. And he just gave us this whole, backstory had created from nothing, and he was like, okay, go. Come on, man. Well, last night, gotta get you cleaned up. Why, where are we going? Future. I certainly did not know that I would be playing the role for 10 years. I remember uh, going in for the Steve Rogers role, not getting that, and then getting a call about this role and being told about it and, and where it could go, but it didn't seem that there was any commitment really. And, and the MC was still very young at the time. There was always a, a humble sort of kind of attitude from Kevin and everybody there, which was like, look, we have plans and we want to make these movies and we want to keep building this universe, but we don't know, it could work, it, it might not work, but I knew at the end of the story, I was gonna fall off this train and that I was gonna be given this green sleeve, which would indicate that I would be losing this arm and then I could go into the Winter Soldier uh, storyline. And so that was the only sort of indication I had that potentially I could be coming back, but no one, no one had said anything to me. And then basically on the day when, it was, when we were shooting that scene, they were like, yeah, we're not gonna do the green sleeve. And I just thought, oh, like, that's, that's it. Like, I'm just gonna die on that train. There's no coming back. But they just didn't know what arm they were gonna use or something and kept going from there. It was always such an interesting character and I felt really lucky once we got it into the Winter Soldier storyline because it was essentially a very relatable character in the sense that it was a guy struggling with his past and, and he was at the center of all these crimes without really having been aware of it. I thought that was a really interesting kind of complex idea for a, for a character. The journey with him and Steve Rogers is really interesting about these two guys who are both out of time and out of place and trying to find their way again in a different world they don't understand. That whole thing was relatable. What the hell is that? Everyone's got a gimmick now. I was the first person to fight Spider-Man in the MCU. Tom Holland, I mean, that's figures, right? I guess we helped him out. It was so weird and, and wild because it was such a funny moment with sort of him catching the arm and the, the punch and everything. And um, Anthony and I sort of having to come together over here. Basically, Anthony and I got a show because of Tom Holland. I guess that's like what I'm realizing now as I'm talking, which is something I'd really hate for him to know. Tom, that is, not Anthony. I just think Kevin Feige doesn't get as much credit as he deserves for being the genius mastermind of putting this entire thing together. And every single movie to me feels intricately kind of tied to something else and to another storyline. And it just, it's, there's a lot to those movies, I think, that sometimes they don't get the credit that they deserve. 
I've been carefully monitoring my glucose levels, so I'm really in a sweet spot right now for sustained energy. <laughs> you're, the, uh, you're the to the max driver, you got a drink. Steven Soderbergh, I felt, was one of the calmest, easiest director I've, I've ever worked with. It felt that once he had cast you in the movie, then it, it was for a reason, and it was up to you to sort of take, take the moment and, and run with it. Playing back on that Black Swan ideology, I just wanted to be around good directors and people I admired, and I didn't really care like the size of the part or whatever, and, and that's a relationship that I still have with both of those men. I think it, this is a director's medium, and, and I think ultimately I, I don't believe a, an, a performance can save a movie as much as a director can save a performance. Even with the writing, it's always sort of about the director because it's his vision or her vision. You're going to have to figure out a way to kind of fit into that. But you're looking for trust, you're looking for guidance, you're looking for freedom, and they have to sort of know when to leave you alone, but then also to kind of encourage you to go in a certain way. I ever tell you what I was most afraid of growing up? No. <laughs> oh my. Oh my? Yeah, you know, like in the uh, Wizard of Oz when they say lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. Oh my. <laughs> my brother convinced me that oh my's were gonna come in the middle of the night and eat me alive. You're so fucking dumb. It was such a well-written script. It was. It was so unbelievable. It was funny and yet brutal and it was an insane story that I didn't even know about and obviously getting to meet Margot and and having a few chemistry reads with her it just felt like this is a really great company of, of people telling this important story and finding a way to do it in a very unique different way than we've seen before so at the time I'd never played a real person before so I was mortified and I certainly didn't live his life and I don't I didn't remember that when I was growing up as a kid in the, in the 90s but Steven Rogers who was and that's his name <laughs> was um, is an amazing writer and he'd gone and he had interviewed Jeff and he'd interviewed uh, Tanya and so I had this great audio and I just went back to looking at all the footage I could and I went to Portland Oregon and I just I wanted to go to where they met where they went on their first date all these things were in the script a lot of Itania is actually uh, very much the telling of the story f from Jeff's point of view as well. When I was there, I thought I, I, should, I should try to at least see if he would be willing to, to, to meet, and he was, and, um, and, and that was helpful. It was a big moment for me to sort of end up in that film. It was such an experience that I, that I grew from that a lot of things kind of shifted from there for me. Pamela. Yes, Tommy. <gasps> Would you do me the insane honor of being my wife? Pam and Tommy is Craig Gillespie. He's the one that reached out to me in October of 2020 and said, I'm working on this and I think you should play Tommy Lee. I had been trying really hard to work with him again since I Tanya, and finally he called me with, with this role. I knew Lily James was gonna be involved. I thought she was great in what I'd seen her prior to that. The only issue was that it was a role that I, I'm not sure what, what told him that, that I should be playing uh, Tommy Lee, right? Because I have no tattoos on my body. I've never played the drums. I, I mean, I knew of Motley Crue and the story, uh, but there was a lot about it that I didn't know. And then reading the eight episodes really kind of made me very worried. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to be this guy, but I, I have to be a part of this. The writing was so good. I mean, each of the episodes reveal the story in a, in, a, in a fresh new way. Even looking at the research that I was able to find about what happened online hadn't really been told before and certainly not as considerate in terms of her experience being pregnant and trying to start a family. And I just sort of thought I have to kind of just follow the writing because it was all in there. And then it was a lot of conversation with Lily about trying to capture what appeared to have been a really intense, passionate connection between these two people, all while the media was just breathing down their neck. I, I think the intention was always to, to focus on them and them as people and the invasion of privacy that occurred rather necessarily than, than the scandal in itself. But I don't think anybody knew how that tape was stolen. They had nothing to do with this. Uh, and, and that's something that's wildly misinterpreted to this day. And again, 
this is a dramatized version of something. The writers did, did a, a good job researching it, but we will never truly know because we're never going to be them. And we have to just find ways to tell stories so that, that we can continue to kind of re-examine things and sometimes ask ourselves questions. And humor and tone sometimes is a, is a very good way to, to, to process difficult things. So we can play with certain projections that we might have had of them, uh, but at the end of the day, you got to see what the, what the truth and what the authentic experience might have been for these people. It's always about the choices you make. And I think as you get older, you feel it, so much more goes into it. And it's a long period of time out of your life to commit to something. So it has to really pull you and engage you in a certain way. But I've always loved being able to kind of be challenged in, in ways that I haven't before. So I'll just keep looking for those opportunities.